Hello and welcome to the Kuyamunge Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach. And on behalf of our Board of Directors, Advisors, Volunteers and Supporting Members, we do want to thank you for joining us today. The Kuyamunge Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness in the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist, Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And our focus is reflected in three main areas, experience, education, and exploration. We respect the path of academic balance, the creative pursuit of science, while advancing, conserving, and restoring a direct experience of that deeper human connection to all of life. It is part of our mission to expand our own experiential research with the multidisciplinary understanding that's available to us today. So as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars and in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That's why we call this conversation for exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics from the arts to the sciences and everything in between, and there's so much more. We probably have a couple hundred presentations available for you, both included in webcast and uh, also our podcast. So please do visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of these presentations are free and it's a nonprofit. Of course, we invite you to become a supporting member, uh, join our community family, and we wanna thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queermongay Institute. Today, throughout history, there's been many civilizations that left their mark on the world through their impressive architectural designs, artistic creations, innovative technologies. And while some of these ancient technologies have been lost to time, others continue to mystify and amaze us today. And one area of research that continues to reveal itself in these ancient sites is the intentionally crafted properties of acoustics. There's ongoing research from cultural anthropology, experimental archaeology, ethnomusicology that literally creates a buzz as we discover the sophistication of the ancients. And applying acoustical methods to the study of archaeological sites and artifacts reveals new information on our ancestors and ancient civilization world around us. Well, it's um, a noted feature, but we were talking with one of the groundbreaking researchers back in, what, 1999? Uh, Paul Devereaux, who was among the first that we ever heard that noted that ancient sites often had acoustical properties that were either natural, enhanced, or built into some temples and, and stone buildings. And uh, he joins us today. He's the author of some 28 books, including Stone Age Soundtracks, The Acoustic Archaeology of Ancient Sites, which was also the basis for the TV program, Secrets of the Dead, Sounds from the Stone Age. This is thrilling to us to really celebrate all the various sophistication and uh, means of ritual of our early, early ancestors. Uh, Paul Devereaux is also the co-founder and managing editor of the academic publication, Time and Mind, the Journal of Archaeology consciousness and culture. And he's the archaeology columnist with 40 and Times. He not only talks today about um, archaeoacoustics, but also earth lights. I've seen an earth light, and I don't think ball lightning was sufficient explanation for this. He's got such a wide scope of research, but this is what we'll focus on today. And we want to welcome from the UK. Hello, Paul, good to have you here again. I first met you in what you were telling me, 1999 on radio. Uh, that's where we first met you. So good to have you back. You've always been one of my favorite guests, I have to say. Um, you've been looking at uh, archaeoacoustics since 1985. Tell us your whole track, your journey. What got you onto these earth mysteries? And where you conclude that, hey, the mysteries within us, if you really under, want to understand planet Earth, some of these mysteries, part of it's within us. I appreciate your perspective. Uh, <clears throat> well, thank you. Um, acoustics is one thing. Earth mysteries is a much bigger topic. And nobody calls it that anymore. Mm. Uh, 
uh, the, the sort of ancient mysteries and various terms people have given a lot of it sort of new age stuff uh, but uh, for me it was a series of experiences um, and I'll explain those in a bit uh, they really got me started I'm by the way I'm now the retired editor of uh, time and mind as I've got to a certain age where I can't do any more uh, and so uh, but it's still functioning still working away very well uh archaeoacoustics it's a big word i have difficulty saying it quite often um uh, and it's really very simple it's just the study of sound at ancient sites and more specifically archaeological sites and um i can show you some aspects if you like uh with slides should i do that and that'll expand it a little sure when you're ready go ahead and launch your slides there are it, archaeoacoustics is a huge area uh, of study getting more complex all the time uh, but it basically runs down into three areas one is simply listening to the existing uh, sound landscape of a place echoes ringing rocks i'll talk about them in a minute ambient sounds of a site, uh, waterfalls, running water, wind, and so on. Um, the other, another approach, number two there, is investigative research using electronic instrumentation. That's the most technical aspect of, uh, of archaeoacoustics. Um, and I'm not going to get into that now. Uh, I've been doing some, but it's not my main area. And third is the modern performance of music and, and singing and chanting at an ancient site to experience uh, their acoust acoustic properties. How do they echo? How do they resonate? And so forth. Uh, and uh, ultimately, though, those three approaches sum up uh, archaeoacoustic study. Personally, I go for the simply lis listening because I'm a simple person. Um, and uh, particularly ringing rocks and some rocks if they're struck with a small pebble uh, will ring like a drum or a bell or various other things uh, musical instruments harps even uh, and uh, I'll show you some of those now if I can Okay, this is uh, called the Balafetris Ringing Rock. It's on the Scottish island of Tyree on, off the west coast of Scotland. And this, it's a small island, Tyree, and this rock is not, it's alien to it. It isn't um, native. But for some reason, people very early on realized it has special properties, namely that it could ring. And there's a sort of uh, an image they post alongside it uh, very speculative I must say of a group of ancients bashing away at the rock um, and it's we won't go into that too much um, okay okay so here's me bopping away knocking on rock yeah I think. thank you properties that allow that to happen that's and another story yeah. um so this rock is uh, on the uh, uh the isle of iona again a holy isle in the hebrides in a hebrides mm -hmm. of scotland um and again it's it you can hit all the other rocks around and they're just like plunk you know rock on rock mm -hmm. but this one rings don't know 
when this goes back to uh, possibly when the uh, the Christians first arrived on the island, or it might be older than that. It may be Bronze Age or whatever Iron Age. Uh, we just don't know. Now this is a ringing rock of Vision Quest site Zion Wash, uh, Southern California. Mm. Uh, the image on it dates to about 500 AD, as you see, um, and it's in the middle of a Vision Quest site. And if you hit it, what is the image of though? The image yeah. is probably, you see, there was a belief throughout uh, pre Columbian America and subsequently uh, that spirits reside inside the rocks and their echoes were their voices coming out. Uh, it was all over, certainly North America, uh, not trace it anymore. And as Charla pointed out, uh, that long point is really pointing to the most. Uh, acoustic part of the rock. Ah, mm. interesting. Right, like a little arrow. Okay. So yeah, it's it's a representative of the spirit in the stone, if you like. Hmm. Now, this one is one of the few that I know of that's on display as a ringing rock uh, in a museum. And this one, Bell Rock, is uh, from Bowers Museum in Santa Ana. And there it is generally. Uh, and there's some of the depressions caused by ages of hitting the rock by people. We know something about the purpose of this rock. Uh, it, it was in Bell Canyon, uh, but there was a rumor that there was a treasure in the rock or around the rock. Uh, and a couple of idiots went up there and offloaded it and he rolled down to the bottom of the canyon. Mm. Now the okay. thing that's really important about that is that a ringing rock to fully resonate needs space around it, hmm. uh, pretty much all around it. Um, and this was on sort of stones, rocks, boulders, uh, so it could resonate clearly and easily. Hmm. Uh, but uh, anyway, so uh, in the 1930s, I think, the uh, the Indians, indigenous people, brought the rock to Bowers Museum and said, look after it because there's, you know, hooligans out there. Mm -hmm. And so unfortunately, what Bowers Museum did, they put it down on a, uh, a, a, a plinth of concrete, which stops it ringing. Ah. Yeah. But at least you can go and see it. and. Uh, it was used, they think, in uh, rites of passage uh, mm -hmm. for young girls uh, in, in, in Indian tradition. So it's a way for Mother Earth to speak as well, mm -hmm. to, to be interactive. And do you think the museum would ever put it Obviously, on a... Uh, contains spirits. In China, uh, they believe that certain rocks held chi. Mm -hmm. uh, Life spirit power, and it was thought to be healthful to sit by one of these rocks because it enhanced your own chi. It was healthy, in other words. Yeah. And um, anyway, now here's here's this is India was the most sophisticated use of uh, ringing rocks. Uh, we know, in fact, uh, there was archaeologists from Britain and India. Uh, found rocks on a ridge uh, that had markings on them uh, and also marks where they had been hit. These rocks were about two, these images anyway, were about 2,500 years old. But not so far away, 50 or so miles, is uh, uh, Hampi, or, uh, as it's now called, Vijayanagara, and it's... Uh, its temple, various temples, this one here, uh, incorporated 
ringing rocks in the form of thin uh, columns, as you see here. Mm -hmm. They ring, and they ring at different notes, very carefully done. Uh, <laughs> the bass notes of, uh, uh, of uh, right. classical Indian music. <laughs> and it's some, an instrument, then. It's an instrument. Fabulous. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. It's, uh, and uh, there's about at least seven other temples that I, I know of who, that also have ringing rocks um, built into their structure. Uh, Is it a light uh, tap or a or pretty full force tap to get these to ring? I mean, how delicate did you have to be with these? Delicate, very delicate, apparently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've never actually struck one, but uh, they're very easy going. Of course, in the day of the Raj, the mm -hmm. British were fascinated by these things and thought there must be something inside those columns that produce the sound. Uh, and they sawed one of them in half. Oh, God. It's solid rock all the way through. And oh, the idea yeah. that rock rings is not automatic to people. Right. And it's, um, uh, one of those things. Mm -hmm. We were in the caves of Tulum, quite famously, the stalagmites that meet the stalactites, right. creating columns, nature made. Those ring as well. Yeah, just quite the size of your fist and the amazing Light sound. And yeah. vibe. Yes, exactly. It was yeah. quite the experience. Some of, some of the, well, certainly one of the Mayan uh, temples, for example, is so designed that it catches a wind that comes before uh, a hurricane. <laughs> and so it sounds a note, uh, an oh. alarm note, just right. in the very structure of the temple. Wow. Don't ask me to, to remind you of which one because I've forgotten it, but never mind. But that would serve as an early warning device for her. Early, right? early warning yeah. device. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. So now we, we're doing this other thing here um, landscape and perception. Uh, it was a project I did with John Wozencroft for the Royal College of Art uh, and uh, called Landscape and Perception, as you see here. I don't know whether the thing is still up, the uh, website might be. Anyway, what it was, it was an audiovisual study to attempt to look and listen as if with Stone Age eyes and ears. Oh, fun. Yeah. And so we, we obviously had to be a fairly untouched landscape. And the one we went for uh, was Proselli in Wales and focusing on the Carn Menin Ridge, which is that one in the sunlight there. And it's the source area, that area around it, on and on it, uh, of the Stonehenge Bluestones. <laughs> wow. So, uh, sound may well have been integral to the reason why the bluestones became uh, important enough to shift 200 kilometers to the site where Stonehenge now stands. And indeed, the bluestones were set up elsewhere first uh, and then brought to. These are the bluestones, by the way, not just those three, there's about 60 or so of them, um, 80 originally. Uh, they're the shortest stones and Stonehenge, these big things, the trilithons, uh, are sarsen stones, were added much later, hundreds of years after this. So these were the first stones, uh, the uh, blue stones. And there's a clue, there's a Proselli village called uh, Mein Klochoch, and that is Welsh for ringing rock or bell stone, depends how you choose to translate it. There's also a bell stone quarry, now defunct, nearby. And these are hints, well, some property here in the rocks that is worth mentioning and putting on the nameplate of a village. Uh, and also back in the 1950s, uh, Bernard Fagg, he was a he worked in India for a long while and he found lots and lots of ringing rocks there that were uh, viewed with awe and uh, turned into basically into musical instruments wow. uh, by 
those tribes, especially Nigeria, but all over. Mm. Uh, uh, he was also the uh, uh, curator of uh, a, a museum in Oxford. And he pointed out, these are particularly musical stones, he says, mm. uh, and, uh, you know, worth looking at. So we thought, hey, let's have a look and a listen. So we went to the Khan Menin Ridge and we did a, over several visits. We, we followed transects across the ridge and various other outcrops of rocks around the ridge um, and tapped each one, knocking on rock. Uh, and we wanted to see how many of them rang. And we made a note of all this. And the upshot is that about 10% of all rocks ring on Priscilla. Mm -hmm. well, mm -hmm. uh, but in certain areas where there looks to be a lot of activity, like perhaps a prehistoric uh, uh, quarry area, um, it can go up to 20 or 30% of the stones there. Mm -hmm. So anyway, this is what we did. That is ringing like a bell. Yeah. This one here, it rings like a tin drum. different sound then oh yeah they're varied a range of different sounds um, mm -hmm. metallic sounds basically from rock uh which is and not all rocks do it you see i mean i thought it was because this can you see this pointer by the way yes we can mm -hmm. yes um i thought it was because of this crack in the rock was allowing it to ring but then you see this one i say crack we hit this one no no metallic mm -hmm. sound at all just rock um, so, um, and nobody's yeah. figured out what the special quality of a particular rock is that allows it to ring. Let me get to, to that because okay. it's a contentious subject. So we thought, hang on, then if these stones eventually ended up as the Stonehenge blue stones on a very circuitous journey, it seems to be they went on. Um, we asked permission, and it was very difficult to get. Um, uh, to, to knock on the blue stones in Stonehenge, in situ. Uh, and uh, so we bopped on the blue stones, uh, but disappointingly, they did not ring, not the purity of ringing anyway, the resonance. You could tell some had resonance. You could actually feel it and, and vaguely hear it. But then we found out that the, the blue stones were actually set in concrete. Uh, the archeologists go through not listening to anything plonked it down and that <sighs> deadens the sound that they might otherwise make. One thing we did notice at close quarters, you see the edges of these two blue stones. Yes. They've been knocked. And we don't know whether it was before they were moved from the Priscilla Ridge uh -huh. uh, or whether they were damaged en route. Mm -hmm. But uh, it could also be that they the spirits in the rock uh, were activated by ritual before they were removed from the rock. From the, from the quarry. And maybe those spirits are displeased now. Yeah. Mm. So. Okay, another obvious type of sound that rocks can make are echoes. And here's a classic example. Mazinor Rock in Mazinor Lake at Bon Echo Provincial Park in Ontario, Canada. And you, uh, this goes, this is a 400 foot deep 
fault ridge. And on it, at the very base level where the water is, just above it, are about 200 uh, Indian paintings, markings, pictograms, uh, just above the waterline. And they were in, would have been bright originally, but now they've all faded. But you can just see one being pointed out there. Right. And a load of them. And the echoes from this wall of, uh, of rock is exceptional. And in the summertime, they have riverboats going along uh, where everybody can clap their hands and make sounds to hear the echoes coming back, how remarkable they are. Wow. Further research uh, has shown us that places, rock surfaces with excellent echo properties were, were, were revered uh, by the uh, Indians and they uh, mark them. These were the spirits in the rock. And also, in some cases, the, the local shaman would drink a psychoactive brew, go in onto his spirit journey, and in amongst the cracks of the rock to meet the spirits in the rock and gain extra mm. supernatural power. Mm -hmm. and this was quite a regular thing uh, in many parts of, uh, of Canada and probably elsewhere. It certainly happened, for example, we know in Southern Africa. Now, another interesting echo is, is this one, the White Shaman Shelter in Texas. Mm -hmm. It's more or less overlooking the Rio Grande. It's extremely hazardous to get to because this slope is uh, very, very steep. Uh, but it's festooned with <laughs> with these images, curious images. Mm. And it is thought this one here is perhaps the, uh, these things are about 2000 or more years old. Uh, that that is an image of uh, an out of body experience, the soul flight of the shaman, if you like. Mm -hmm. So that's the white shaman there, apparently rising up from a similar shape that's dark uh, and it's, we don't know but we think that probably is an early perhaps the earliest depiction of the out-of-body experience <laughs> shaman's trance right uh, uh, and that's not too far out because these people the the, pe the indians that did did, did this um took uh peyote uh, and other psychedelics uh, where they would have the out-of-body experience uh, and they left little pouches around I've seen one of them uh, with various things little crystals and so on and oh. psychoactive beans or pieces of peyote and so on uh, so we know they definitely used this yeah. and it, this site is not so far away from uh, I'm trying to think. These, these are think moments. Um, no, no. We shall. We shall. Yes, right. Thank you. Oh, yeah. So, uh, because they, you know, they have a pilgrimage and collect peyote, uh, although they get interfered with now because it's you know, supposedly illegal. Um, and they collect them up in baskets. It's called the. Uh, Hunt of the deer, the whole thing about that. Uh, and they bring them back and use them in ritual throughout the rest of the year. Hmm. And they use the visions for their textiles. And all oh, those very uh, colorful. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was observed by a local archaeologist who became uh, uh, an archaeologist. Sorry, she wasn't an archaeologist, she was an artist. But she pointed this out, but nobody was listening to her, so she became an archaeologist officially. And now they listen to her. Oh. And what's interesting about that is that if you're looking out now from the from that cave, from that rock shelter, and you're if you talk normally, uh, you're 
conversation can be heard clearly on the other side of, of, of uh, the water here. And uh, what is the name of that river? It's where the. Um, oh God. Isn't that Taco? It's Taco, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, no, it's the. Uh, um, anyway, it's feeding into the. Uh, we'll find out and let you know. Yeah. Rio Grande, yeah. All this is in my books, by the way. Yeah. So, really want to know. Have a read. Have a read. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> 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 Indeed. I'll tell you a little bit about them later. Anyway, so it's, it's remarkable acoustics. Uh, and uh, so normal speaking will project out. Uh, and if you face the white shaman and you shout at it. Yes. Echoes of that can be heard all the way down the ravine. Mm. So you secondary echoes, tertiary echoes, further down. Like, it sounds like the ravine is full of spirits. It's quite dramatic. Um, and this is the flattest part of that curved wall uh, and where they, they put the, uh, the shaman. It's going in 1952, this, this uh, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. An example. I'll be done with all this shortly, and then we can discuss anything you want. Sure. Uh, this this site is Brincaffery D in Wales. It's a Neolithic mound uh, with a passage and a chamber inside. There's actually a standing stone inside the chamber. Uh, outside is a standing stone with these patterns and markings on them, and what we do now, if we go to a site we've not been to before, we clap our hands because that's a good way of testing any echo capacity. And we did that and we noticed a point echo coming back from the surrounding landscape, very specific. And we realized it was coming from this. Mm. And that's a close up, obviously. And this is the hand clap, and there's the echo. Ah. Very specific. Uh, and then there was something else we did not know about when we were doing all this. Uh, and a local, well, an archaeologist who studies a lot of Welsh sites, George Nash, said, hang on, there's more to it than this. And he uh, pointed out there are prehistoric cut markings on it. There's about eight altogether. These are just three of them. So the question arises, mm. was this the site that was holy, sacred, venerated first, and the actual natural outcrop with its echoes? And right. was that why they put, put Brinkethley D, built the monument uh, in that area within the echo zone? Uh, and I think it is that. I think it predates, obviously, geologically predates the... Uh, uh, the monument. Let me just recap. Mm -hmm. So I think that was put up after. And they would put a monument there because that's where Mother yeah, was. A lot of, a lot of sa monumental sites, sacred sites generally, that are man made, built, artificial, are often in areas close to mm -hmm. uh, areas that were already venerated as, as holy. Uh, for generations beforehand and by putting them it's like the stones of Stonehenge uh, coming from a natural rock area and it sort of sanctifies the new site the the artificial site right. uh, I think they went on quite a lot for example on a moorland Bodmin Moor in Cornwall uh, in, in, in Britain um, almost every stone circle is either within sight of a natural outcrop, uh, a tor, as they're called, or uh, very close to it, right underneath it, which suggests wow. certain. Okay, other ways the old stones can speak. 
This is petroglyph rock in Ontario, sometimes called the teaching rocks. Uh, and it's a slab of metamorphosed, um, yeah. metamorphosed marble. Uh, and there are other slabs like it, slanted slabs like that. Uh, uh, but they don't have any petroglyphs on them. This one has got about 900. Wow. <laughs> Clearly, there was something special about this uh, particular slab. Mm -hmm. It's got a covering over it to protect it because the acid rain was beginning to damage it. Mm -hmm. And But I thought, well, you know, what's special about it? Could it be acoustic in some way? <laughs> well, I couldn't get down there and hit it, uh, but talk to the warden lady. And I said, is there any sound of acoustics associated with this? Well, it's, just, it's strange you should ask, because you see that physio, that, that crack running along the face. Yep. It's about five meters deep. Oh. And she said, when there's groundwater running along the bottom, it issues a sound. And she said, it sounds like whispering human voices. So we reckon it was used as a oracle site. Right. And I published this actually in 14 times, come to think of it, uh, an article on this. And then I was contacted by uh, uh, an elder, uh, uh, an Indian elder. Uh, and he said, you're the first white person. To, to mention this yeah and it, uh, they hold a ritual every year and i was invited to join them with their ritual on the slab itself on the it's a huge rock by the way wow. <laughs> and, uh, i said when i can next get to canada i will do that i haven't been since unfortunately but um uh, yeah that's the, that's the acoustic connection that incidentally uh, there's another slab like that in um, the Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, it's very similar. Uh, and it's set in, they set it in the ground now. And uh, you can't touch it because of the hawk eyed lady watching me. And I didn't fancy being up in a Russian jail, but <laughs> the, the, the carvings resonate with one another that are like these ones these when you see a figure carved with a head like that with rays coming out that's the shaman that's the sacred mm -hmm. activator uh, i can't i don't know what all of them are but uh, there, there's a lot of things snakes like this often snake carvings prehistoric carvings or pre-columbian i should say in this case uh, always seem to be coming out of a crack in the rocks and that's another indication mm -hmm. of the idea of there being spirits inside. And of course, uh, this thing here is the living Place embodiment. Place of emergence, yeah. So there we go. Wow. Now, this one won't mean so much to you because it needs the sound, <laughs> but it's called the blowing stone. And it's got natural, uh, it's near the White, White Horse of Uffington, which is uh, probably late Bronze Age, carved on the side of the, the hillside. Anyway, this is down in the valley. And if you blow into a certain orifice on the rock, it makes a sound. I'll do it just for, so I can hear it. Um, <laughs> So it makes a sound like that. And then, and then we understood that it was, it was a hunting rock. And it's very much like the sound of a, of a stag. It did, yes. It did sound like that. I wonder if they'd answer. And maybe hunters used it to attract the yeah. deer. Mm -hmm. hmm. So clever. Now here's something. This thing is called the Treasury of Atreus in Mycenae in Greece. 
All these are just pure few picked examples. There's loads more. Um, so sound was really important uh, in the pre-modern and ancient world. Uh, this thing here is about 20 feet tall. So, And if you go inside, uh, it's a perfect dome. And if you put your ear near the wall, there's a, a sound like bees, a, a buzzing of bees. Oh. If you stand in the center, it's completely dead. There's no um, huh. uh, sound, completely like a, a, a TV studio, you know, absolutely. There's a term for it, anechoic or something. Anyway, what it is, it's a whispering gallery effect. Any the ambient sound outside gets fed in and whizzed around the dome, uh, and, and near it you'll hear a bee-like buzzing sound. Now that could be significant because the uh, to the ancient Greeks, bees were sacred. Bees were cons considered the voices of the muses or of the dead. And what they did here, laying out the dead, either shallow graves or actually laying on the surface of the uh, of the earth. Uh, and so with that sound, there were the muses, there was the voices of the spirits, and again could have been used for oracle purposes. Now here's a beauty. Um, this is uh, in Malta. We had that pleasure of being there. Yeah. Hyper, hypergeum, yeah. Yes, hypergeum. Yeah. And it's a it's it's subterranean, really. Um the top layer, top floor is as it were, would have been on the surface. Then there's two layers below. Uh and the echoing properties are remarkable with it. Uh you can make a sound that can last for you hear it echoing in different departments further down below the one you're at and so on. However, it was long known, this is 1900, this photograph. Uh, you come into this thing called the Oracle Room, one of the chambers. That line is where the uh, earth was built up before it was excavated. Uh. This is the hole proved into the next chamber. But here, as the thing says, was it's called an acoustic niche or recess. Hmm. Um, it was noted that if you speak into that, it really resonates around the whole hypogeum, very powerful. Hmm. Uh, and But the archaeologists for years and decades said, well, it's just the way it is. It's, you talk into that, it will resonate. There's no significance about it. Uh, and I beg to differ. So when you come in, as you can see, there's this design. This is a Neolithic design on the ceiling. It looks and so modern. It does look modern. Well, it's been out of the sun, out of anywhere for a long while. But anyway. The, the archaeologist said, well, it's just a, a, a Neolithic depiction of a tree of life or something of that nature, which it may or may not be. But um, you will notice that there are these round things, presumably yeah. the fruit of this tree. You can see it again. And what you'll also notice as you go into the chamber, the, uh, the fruit gets larger and larger as it approaches where the uh, niche is. Mm. And then there's a line. There's a line. And there's nothing and never has been anything painted on the ceiling after that. Hmm. So that I struck me as interesting. Yeah. The clincher is that it is an, a, a really a way of mapping the acoustics. Oh. <laughs> and when you go into the niche, and there it is, you find the fruit in there. There's three of them. And that's the clincher. And nobody noticed that. No modern archaeologists. 
Uh, and so we've now established something that really was acoustic, that was well known by the makers or users of the hypergeon. Uh, and, uh, and that's what this thing is about. It doesn't- It was intentional, and these are their notes about yeah. it. And the Definitely. solid, bigger core was the amplification of sound and notation for that? They recognized that in this hollow, there was louder sound and it could yeah. be used by a priest or priestess uh, mm -hmm. to speak uh, or uh, any sort of uh, person functionary. Uh, and it would be heard all over the- The blessings are spread, yeah. Yeah, because of the acoustic property of the whole hypogeum. Mm -hmm. So I, I was rather pleased with that. And uh, now everybody quotes it like it was always known. It wasn't always known. Anyway, so there we are. I've got a few little pictures uh, relating to earth lights. Wow, okay. Do you want to do that now? Do you want to talk sure. about that? Sure, yeah. Let's it? watch it because we've, we'll have lots yes. of questions on both. Literally, yeah. I think there's only three slides here. Okay. Okay, this, this thing was uh, photographed by David Kubrin from the car park of Pinnacles National Monument. Oh, wow. And he was a trained physicist. And he saw this thing whiz over the treetops. There's the tops of the trees. Uh, and he said it was odd because he could see it shooting before it got to this point without making any uh, Sound. waves in the air, airwaves ahead of it. He oh. said, which told him there was no mass there. Oh. Uh, but uh, it stopped and started to spin. And this is by the time he got his camera out, and it's just starting to spin here but you, you notice you know a few fo shape uh anyway this this it dissolved eventually it spun away and, and dissolved uh that to me is an earth light yeah and it is also over the pinnacles fault and there does seem to be a connection between certain light phenomena and faulting now where this is noticeable elsewhere well Hesdalen, Norway, been there and done that. Uh, and they, they, in fact, you can go online and if you go to Hesdalen uh, or Hesdalen Lights, there's actually a, a, a website you can go to where you can in real time study the, the valley, the Hesdalen Valley, the Dalen, in other words, the Hesdalen Valley. Uh, uh, and you can spend hours burning your eyes out looking for lights. Uh, and <laughs> it was occur regularly. Okay. They don't. Uh, they're irregular now, but they used to be pretty regular back in the 1980s, and that's when they sent up the Hesed Island project. Uh, now run for the last decade or two by Erling Strand, uh, and he set up a whole unit on the side of the of the valley. Uh, with monitoring equipment and cameras and so on. So they can keep a permanent watch for any further lights. And they, they, they eased off now, uh, but they do still occur from time to time. Anyway, in 1905, there was a wave of light phenomena. And it was... Wow. In Part here of Wales, you see the little blacked out area. Uh, and it's near Harlech. Now that they were seen mainly along a particular line. Uh, so it occurred at the same time as a religious revival. And the, uh, and the two were related, yes. Well, they, they they said that you know it probably was hallucinations mm. or you know whatever. Yeah. Uh, but they went on, and there were specific lights, all kinds of lights, triangles of light, and spheres of light, and one thing and another. Mm. Uh, and uh, finally, the the local newspaper man said, you know, to the London big tabloids and so on come up and have a look for yourself see what you make of it so they did and uh bloody hell they said it they're real these are real uh <laughs> phenomena because it was very active at this time 
And what they hear, for example, this in this chapel, near this chapel, because the people come and go to the chapel, they saw three balls of red light in this field and go up into the air and cavort around one another before flying away. Uh -huh. Well, they didn't put that now that we know now, but they didn't know then. This it's all on the Mokras fault, uh, a major local fault, and that depicts its course. Mm -hmm. And here, Some geophysical got, pressure, yeah, okay, it could be that, um, uh, or it creates electric electrical situation that allows these phenomena phenomena to occur, uh, mm -hmm. and it could be pressure, rock pressure, or whatever. Also happens over water, particularly reservoirs and so on, where there's an unusual body of water in place, and that could also be pressure on the underlying uh, geology. Uh, and so they've been seen around all the chapels along here, but also rolling down the road. These lights had exceptional properties, apart from the fact they were there. Uh, some were seen coming out of the ground, like I've indicated. <coughs> Um, uh, and some, and this was witnessed by, two, well, I think, from the Daily Telegraph and the Daily Mirror reporters, because there was a bar of light, blue light, about four foot wide, hovering over a road, side road. Um, and uh, the Telegraph guy couldn't see anything, but the, chat, the Daily Mirror on the other side could easily see it. Oh. So you could only see this light uh, and a lot of the lights from one angle only. Oh, wow. I've never. That, heard. Well, it, it strikes me that it was. Wow. It's a pure guesswork because I'm no physicist. Yeah. But could it be sort of macro quantum phenomenon? Uh, and I've talked to some researchers, so it could be possible. And they're producing tiny little beads of light in the laboratory. Uh, <sighs> But uh, they could be macro quantal, but we we don't know. It's not just my suggestion. Mm. Uh, and, and anyway, these are sightings of light, and they're very specific. We could actually place where the lights were seen, uh, and then there were these other lights on tributary faults coming into that, and uh, also roads around. So mm. it was a very active thing. Uh, it still happens occasionally, but particularly around this area, oh, uh, okay. the Hlin Peninsula. And the last I know of was in the 1980s. And I talked to the witness guy who was uh, said, well, I was on the on the sand on the beach uh, in front of the uh, sand dunes behind. And he said, this light came in from the sea. Mm. right next to the peninsula and came rolling towards uh, the, the the beach mm -hmm. like, uh, and he said it was about the size of a small car <laughs> only it was sort of round yeah. and came up went over the beach you could clearly see it and went up into the uh, sand dunes uh, and uh, he, so he ran up there and there's not a sign of anything, no burn, no anything. Yep. Uh, so it was just gone. I think that's all I've got. Hold on. Do okay. you mentioned a blue light? Are most of the earth lights that people report white light or different well, qualities uh, of light or what? Wales is uh, particularly prone to this sort of thing. And there are all sorts of colors, but mainly white. Yes, you're right. Um, and uh, one chat we Too talked about. Yeah. was a completely straightforward builder and he said uh, we heard about him and uh, we turfed him out of the uh, the local pub and he said I, i'm going to tell you something he said but don't think it's because i was boozed up i wasn't I just had a point he said then i w walked my way home and he uh, had to go over a bridge because there was a stream on his way home and he said, this light, little light, a sort of football sized light, flying along the stream towards the bridge. He said he was lighting up the water underneath. 
And then it came up onto the uh, bridge, onto the road where he was, and stood there just shimmering. And he didn't like this at all. <laughs> he thought, mm. he had an impression it was uh, observing him. Interesting. You know, he thought, well, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move out of this. Uh, oh, he had a cigarette. Mm. <laughs> lit, a, lit a match, and the thing shot back like a startled animal. Oh my gosh! And he, wow. he thought, mm, this is I've had enough of this, and he, he started running home, and the light started to follow him. And he uh, got yeah. really worried by now. He didn't want this thing to actually come to his house. Uh, so he dived into the bushes at the side of the road and in trees and bushes. And this damn thing moved in through the bushes after him and uh, through branches and that. Uh, it's about and it just, the, the light just went through the branches? I mean, did it move the branches? It did it it just its way around. Uh, and then okay. he got yeah. out. He, he said, you know, this is getting silly. Uh, and he freaked out, basically, and he ran like hell, and the thing didn't follow him any further. Now, what's really interesting about this is not just his account. Uh, the uh, people that same night, other people saw a light too. And in one case, the light tried to get inside somebody's house. Their, their door was open at the door. And then oh, I closed the door and it went off uh, around. Um, and the extra interesting thing here, this particular village was well known in the past for the Canal Corp. It's the Welsh Canal Corp. And it's, um, uh, it means the death light. And it was, it was assumed to be a harbinger of a death in the in the parish. Uh, so there's a back history of this uh, mm -hmm. light phenomena occurring in that area. That's just well, I was going to ask because if the ancients noted acoustics, they were certainly noting earth lights. And yes. what records do we have of ancient observations of earth lights? And what did they make of them? Yeah. Well, <laughs> we know some stuff what they made. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a better written record, but our prehistory is pretty much close to us. We, we don't have much of a record of that. Right. Or soul. Soul notification. Oh. Just come up. Oh, okay. I'll check it out. Excuse yeah. me. Yeah. So, um, well, we can, Paul, we can uh, take some well, questions. Well, I would like to talk about my Earthlight sighting. Okay. Because I would, I've been waiting years to have Paul Devereaux comment on sure. my Earthlight sighting. Sure. Okay, so I have to tell you the story real quick, Paul. Okay. I'm at a meeting hanging out with some girlfriends in Seattle. And then we disband and we're all driving home at the same time. And I'm uh, in Bellevue, Washington, right, a suburb of Seattle. And I'm veering off the freeway and going up towards my house. And the other two live further north. And so they're continuing on their way. And so I'm driving up my street. And there are woods here, big dense woods, house over here, driving up. And I see, time slows down for me. And I see this huge ball of white light coming out of the woods from the top of the trees, slowly arc across the road, go behind our house, backlight it and disappear. Okay. And all the time I'm, I'm noting, okay, time slowing down. And I'm noting, that is so gorgeous. We had just been to a star party at Table Mountain in Eastern Washington. We had just climbed up these tall ladders of, uh, for the telescopes to get to the eyepiece where people assemble these gigantic telescopes. And I was particularly struck by the one aimed at Saturn and her rings. And I was struck by how beautifully incandescent the special quality of Saturn's light. And uh, so I'm thinking as I'm watching this ball of light, that's like the light of Saturn. It's that same beautiful incandescent quality. There's something special about this light. I'm marveling at its beauty and I'm watching how slowly and majestically it's going over and then disappearing. And so then I park, I walk into the house and I go, Paul, 
I just saw a ball of light. Why don't you go? And it's dark. I said, why don't you go in the backyard and see where it is? You know, what happened? He's like, no way. I'm not walking in the dark. <laughs> then I get a phone call. It's one girlfriend. By this time, she's reached home and she said, did you see a UFO? It uh, just went right over what I think might be your house. I'm like, I saw a ball of light. She said, well, I saw a triangular kind of ship. Then I get another phone call. It's the other girlfriend who came even further. I just saw a UFO, it looked cigar shaped, and it looked like it was going over your house. And I'm like, I just saw a ball of light. I only leave it there. I was not associating it with the UFO. I was associating it with maybe a ball of lightning. But when I heard your explanation that these might be ancestor lights or earth phenomenon, I key more into that. But I just report what the other two women had said. Mm -hmm. They saw something similar on the freeway as they were, they were leaving. I deliver my story to you for comment. Yeah. It's interesting because of, as you point out, different perceptions of an yeah. actual phenomenon. And uh, it's hard to know what it was, but I can give you loads of examples very similar. Thank you. The, uh, there was a, I can't remember her name, it's all in the book. Um, uh, in, I think it was the uh, 18, 19, anyway, round about. 1900. Uh, she was an author and she was canoeing on a lake in Western Africa. And she saw a light come out of the trees along the side of the lake. Uh, and in fact, two lights came out and they came down to the, the little strand, the little beach uh, between the trees and the lake. And they moved around each other. Uh, and one shot off, but the other started floating across the lake. Uh, didn't sink, it was just on the surface moving along. So she started paddling like mad uh, to try and catch up with it. And as she got close, it went down under the water and mm. she could um, see it glowing as it went down. She could see it glowing underwater so the light would come up through the water or? She was a very famous uh, author at the time. But I can't mm. Anyway, um, uh, yes, there's various cases of, uh, of balls of light just rising up. A whole load of cases in Wales in the 1905 example. Mm. Uh, and again, there's this funny thing uh, in the Pennines of, of central northern England. Uh, a farmer reported uh, seeing a light. He came out in the early morning, as farmers tend to do, and uh, saw uh, an orange light hovering over the, uh, the stream that runs at the bottom of the farmyard. And he said it lit up the water underneath. But uh, wow. said the thing about it was it was yeah it was a sphere presumably they said it looked flat as well like it wasn't properly situated in our time space it was, it was interesting some odd phenomenon effect mm -hmm. uh, that's happened a number of times the light i saw back in 1967 um or was it 66 a long while ago now um, <laughs> Anyway, I've described it in Earth Lights, my book, one of my books. Yeah. Um, and there, it was a rectangle of light. Oh. It was, in, it was in the top floor of a, uh, art studio. the arts uh, college, where that was studio, and we were working a bit late. But it was in May, and there's still light around, uh, and it was getting just too dark in the studio to mix certain colors mm -hmm. um, getting it accurate so i went over to the window which uh, we were situated south of bromley in kent uh, and uh, which is south of london uh, and started mixing away it suddenly caught my eye and i looked up and there was this rec re re rectangle of pulsing orange light and it was coming this way. And um, I just gobsmacked. I couldn't. Uh, yeah. 
other people came to the window and their jaws drop. People's jaws really do drop when they're, uh, uh, and your mind's racing to, to name, to identify it. And there wasn't anything I could identify. Uh, and it came to a halt and it was a few hundred feet above the fields and less than a quarter of a mile away, just maybe less than a kilometer away, certainly. And it was there pulsing away. And it was perfectly regular, right angle corners. Uh, Hard to imagine it, nature delivering a shape like that. A ball, a sphere, yes, but a rectangle. Hmm. Ah, well, just to do a sidebar here, uh, some of the lights associated with earthquakes in Cornwall, uh, the, the British Geological Survey come down and make a record of all these. Some of them were rectangles of light, huh. like new light color, you know, just strange, and jerking across the sky. And there were spheres, some people described, lots of people saw these, uh, said were like um, the moon, they look like the moon, this moon-like color. Huh. Uh, and then they would dissolve. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so yes, they can be regular shapes uh, and eventually this this rectangle of light dissolved in on itself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and dissipated okay well what happened was about 15 minutes later uh, there was a rosy smudge in the sky where it had been <laughs> god knows what like it, it had was. activated the molecules of the atmosphere and it was like an afterglow or Oh, been, I don't know what it was, it was very odd. And more or less at the same time, this was a very freaky event, more or less at the same time, uh, a group from the college, our college, had gone down to uh, these natural ponds, called Keswick Ponds, and were filming. They were one of the very early video schools, uh, and they, did a, they were making a film about, I don't know, King Arthur and whatever there. And uh, they told me that they were fascinated by what we had seen, rectangular light. But they said they saw, because it's about two miles away, I'd say, a mile and a half, two, three miles, uh, where they were. And they were putting away their equipment. And suddenly this ball of light drops down and hovers over one of the uh, the ponds, two, two twin ponds there. Hmm. And he said it was white, completely luminous thing. And inside was a sort of crescent shape, which was more brilliant light. Uh, hmm. And uh, it sizzled, we could hear it. Uh, and uh, within a minute or two, because oh, cameras are away, you know, um, it shot off. Uh, and that's what the last I say. But that happened roughly the same time as we were seeing this other thing. People on the bus going from the college up to mm -hmm. uh, uh, Bromley also saw this phenomenon uh, go by. Hmm. So that could explain why I had two other different friends right. witnessing it from their perspective. One seeing it orange, one seeing it green, one seeing it triangular, one seeing it like a cigar shape they described right. it. Right. So what is interesting really, of course, they would say UFOs because that's your knee jerk explanation yeah. and it is unidentified and, you know, technically, but, um, and you could, I would imagine project onto it from your imagination, maybe a little bit onto a shape to explain it, where I saw a, a sphere of white. Yeah. The chap Thank you. Who saw it while he was on the bus going away from the college, yeah. he saw it as a white light more or less as a sphere. Well, what we saw was burning orange and perfectly rectangular. So it just showed you how they're shapeshifters. Uh, no doubt about it. And you mentioned fault lines. So I will say that uh, Seattle famously on fault lines nearby, um, we know that they go right through our neighborhood, our old neighborhood, Bellevue. Yeah, That's so true. there's fault lines there. I-90. Yep. yep. And you would think that woods would keep a lot of moisture in the air, generating the, well, all of Seattle's humid, 80% humidity on average. 
Mm. So that would explain like water attraction. So, mm -hmm. oh, interesting. Thank you. We were, we were um, Charlotte and I were lived in Wales for a while in Brecon. Uh, and we had a view of the, uh, the mountains the beacons. called the beacons. Uh, and one evening, much like this actually, uh, there was a uh, you could see balls of light going up the slope. It looked like they were going up the slopes of one of the mountains closest to us. So as it happened, we had binoculars. So I got the binoculars out, and they weren't on the mountain at all. These white lights, they were uh -huh. on top of uh, pine trees in front, being balls of light flickering on, and then going out, then appearing again on another one. And uh, but to the naked eye at this distance, they looked like they were on the mountains. So, you know what my experience made me realize is that I just happened to be at the right time on the, the right moment, the right perspective to see it. And it went right over our house and backlit. Wow. Back, I remember backlit the house. Then it disappeared. But how many times was I not there when these um, phenomena were there? Yeah. You mentioned people were sighting them along the roads. Well, that's because people are on the roads as opposed oh, yeah. to people in the woods. So and they observer, yeah. What goes yeah. on when we're not looking? When know? we're not there. Yeah. yeah. These are probably far more common than we realize. Here's an example. Oh. We were coming back from uh, a conference in eastern England. Charlotte can vouch for this, uh, with a, a couple of people in the back of the car. And it was midnight ish. Uh, and it was all lights as we were approaching Penzance where we lived at that time mm -hmm. and we pulled up from one of those lights and it was overcast and we pulled into a lay-by and looked where we saw the lights coming down uh, and then suddenly out of the cloud base they were white they were golden, golden. Yeah. they were golden lights and they came at an angle like that very softly and then went out of sight and that happened three times. Uh, and uh, the very near the epicenter of where there was an earthquake about 18 months later. So something like that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. But I think the phenomena themselves are not just products of, uh, they're not just uh, earthquake lights, right. but they're, in, they're, they're associated with them. But I think they're an unusual form of uh, plasma. Oh, An unusual plasma. form of plasma. Yeah, okay, visual. that makes sense. I've like even been in that same house where an earthquake was shaking. It felt like the wind going through the house. I walk outside. That's where you're supposed to be. And there was a pond and I got to see the vibration, the cymatics pattern yeah, on yeah. the water surface yeah. of yeah. earth coming through, sending yeah. those shock waves. I, I mean, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I guess my point is so much energy, as you point out, Paul, going through mother earth at any given time some of it we can see some of it we can hear some of it we sense there are people who can sense earthquakes before they have animals certainly and some animals true. certainly do yeah so yeah the mystery lies within and within us as receptor sites and how it appears into our senses mm -hmm. oh, i really appreciate your expanded understanding of this i also appreciate and then we're going to take some uh comments from our audience i also appreciate that you pay attention to eyewitness reports so often these anecdotal stories are dismissed but when you accumulate them and you look at them and you take them seriously in detail they're telling you a lot as you've just demonstrated mm -hmm. so and you cross-reference them like you did for me thank you thank you wow okay who's up first well, let's let's go ahead. First of all, open up for some questions. Many in, very intelligent and, and thought-provoking conversations have been going on in the chat room. Yeah. But uh, I know Tony, you wanted to, he he wanted to know um, what well, to put Tony on uh, rather than me reading your your um, text. There you are. It's one of our well, advisors. Tony has special privileges here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but yes, it's uh, it, it's really fun. Uh, Paul, everything you've been saying, I'm just full of questions. So I, I, I could keep this going for several hours, but we can't do that now, obviously. Uh, Paul, don't look shocked. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I guess first going back to the acoustics and uh, 
and and also the things that are happening on the acoustic rocks. Uh, I do know in Southwest uh, archaeology, in rock art, very often, and same the same in the Californias, in rock art, very often where there's a panel of a rock that's associated with power, uh, that that people will go and take parts of that away for the medicine pouch, they'll really scrape. And it's not intentionally degrading, it's part of the medicine process. Uh, I also do know that in that they're echoing what you said, in many parts of the world, there seems to be a selection effect on, uh, on where you make rock art. It may be a perfectly beautiful panel where you could make, you could do something but a quarter mile down the canyon is where the rock art is. But guess what? A quarter mile down the canyon is where the acoustic, the echoes are. So there does seem to be a, a preferential, I mean, not but, but there is a preferential, a fairly yeah. significant preferential uh, tendency there. So I'm, I'm loving that. Uh, I don't know if you want to comment on that, but I, I, I have questions on the light. Yeah. Uh, Puha, yeah, the Palo places. Uh, in the southwest, uh, especially around the uh, Great Basin area and, and down into um, near Death Valley and all down that area, as we've yeah. seen. Those, yeah, yes. And yes. Um, so it's a similar thing. I should just say, well, you just got that. Uh, light phenomena are seen all around the world. Uh, and they are integrated into the folklore, if you like, of, of the people in the, those areas. That's the record in, I was talking about, the folklore. Yeah, the stories. In Malaysia, excuse me, in Malaysia, they, they are said to be called Kanangal, and they are said to be the spectral heads of women who have died in childbirth. Mm. They... Is Sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, go on. Is there any association between the acoustics of rocks and the presence of, of where the earth lights appear? Mm. Uh, I, I have to ask you that. I don't, I don't want to build no, something uh, that's not. Well, it's not been studied. Uh, I, I suspect there probably is in some cases. Uh, I tell you there's a link between that and where monuments occur yeah not, not so um things like ufos and that or at least not the same sort of things mm -hmm. two trekkers engineers actually were coming down from the mountains in the lake district and they walked past this field where the stone circle is castle rig castle rig, uh, castle rig stone circles and he, he saw white lights moving around over so did his colleague white lights moving around over the stones mm -hmm. so they moved up to the edge of the field to look at these things and one of them broke they said they're going both with and against the wind and uh, he saw one break away and start moving at about head height over the field towards them uh, and he said it was about six foot wide, this ball of white light. And uh, he got closer and he got closer and thought we're going to have to dive down by the little wall by the edge of the field. And then it suddenly disappeared. Yeah. Mm. So uh, that was clearly associated with uh, the light. Also, uh, they've been excavating this fairly recent and excavating where there had been a stone circle. There's only one stone left now in uh, Kalanish, uh, up on a hill slope. Uh, and they found a magnetic anomaly in them. This is university stuff. They found a magnetic anomaly in the center. And it was very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it was where there was a meteorite impact. Ah, uh, uh, wow. Yeah. So I Bring the was all the way around this anomaly. Well, so I have to quickly. My latest book, by the way. Oh, yeah, we want to ask about your latest book. Um, I just have to interject a really quick story. So, 
can activation of ritual um, activate these lights? Can they respond? And I just tell you a quick story. Our friend Louise Gilmore in Australia got invited to a sacred site of the Australian Aborigines, very, very remote, very powerful and sacred. So there's a group of women, she's auntie, is putting them through a ceremony and they start to notice lights twinkling off in the, off in the bushes. And they go, auntie, what are the light? Oh, those are the, those are the ancestors saying hello. We're activating ritual. They've mm -hmm. come to say hello, pay, and pay, pay their respects. Other people would call them fairy lights. So do you see any association between Ooh, ritual and activation? Go ahead. You do that in Ireland, fairy lights. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's stone rocks, boulders known as uh, fairy rocks where the lights are seen. Yeah. Uh, I think so that unseen Tony's question, yeah, there seems to be a connection, but there's yeah. no comprehensive uh, study. Research gotcha. or study at this point. Yeah. If, I could, if I could ask, uh, we've talked about earth lights and now fairy lights. And then, of course, the other thing that's quite being talked about are orbs. Is there any relationship uh, between these or is it totally different things? Orbs, all the orbs I've seen and anybody else has seen, uh, professional photographers and so on, know what the orbs are in these pictures you've seen. I mean, there may be orbs. Well, there are orbs, earth lights. Uh, but uh, no, the orbs you see in people's pictures are, they're not there. They are um, effects of, for example, uh, a flash, you flash on a camera and little flecks of dust or motes close, out of focus, close to the thing. Even dust on the lens could cause flare. Uh, mm. It's like yes. a dog, if there's a bright source in there. So there are many, many explanations. But I, I just had, had to ask that. I have one other question, if, if I may, and and that is, um, while I've not seen a distributed large object like you've described, you know, I am an astronomer. I have spent uh, hundreds of nights at, at large telescopes professionally. And while observing at the National Observatory, I saw one night, a constellation of seven lights that moved across the sky in this very strange way, and then down, then up again, and they were probably several miles away, but they were bright. They were as bright as first magnitude stars, um, but they were point sources. And I'm wondering if, if all these objects are have sharp edges to them, or is it, are they diffuse like a cloud where, where they're more dense optically uh, in terms of, of light in the middle than they are over at the limb? There was um, an outbreak of light phenomena up near Seattle. Yeah. Well, well this, was, this was located uh, outside oh, of Tucson. The exact place. Never mind. Uh, just take my word for it. It's on an Indian reservation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and what we're mainly seen by lookouts for fire wardens, so on. And what I saw was at the National Observatory at Kitt Peak, which is on the Tahoe Odom Reservation, uh, southwest of Tucson. So I just thought I would, I would, yeah, yeah. I would mention that. And, and it, it's a very sacred place with a, with a amazing peak called Baba Kibri, et cetera, on that. Oh. Well, thank you very much. I, I have you, Tony. I, I have at least a dozen more questions, but I, I bought your book, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good job, Tony. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Some yeah, good yeah. questions. Yeah, good comments. You know, the, Paul, there's, there's something about, like, when you go to Malta and you see these megalithic sites, the acts, the size of the stones, the effort that was put out, the um and the the significance of every design in cupola and all the things that went on you can't help but just be wondering what is it about the human the human story the human spirit that drives us to do these things it's not shelter shelter would be so much easier to build than <laughs> and these, simpler <laughs> and simpler but we see these sites and over and over and still to this day we feel this need to build megalithic sized structures outside of ourselves. It's part of that human story that, that continues to uh, to uh, wanna unfold. And I know it's something that 
I personally feel a strong resonance with and been involved with lots of types of, of outdoor construction with between uh, <laughs> between putting together labyrinths and stone circles and and even the home that we live in, which is a dome home, um, all these different kinds of things that, that seem to I'm looking for for what is that story that's probably what got your curiosity going in the beginning as well. It's like, why? What are we doing? I mean, obviously, everybody knows about Stonehenge and all the questions about Stonehenge, but this is this is not localized. This is a worldwide thing in the human story. It is worldwide uh, and focused in certain areas and often transient. Uh, so it's not always in one area it moves. Uh, so some, of the, I'm sure, that some of the stone circles and megaliths and so on are marking areas of supernatural phenomena lights and so on yeah. uh, but sacred light sacred light uh, sacred sites are occur for all sorts of different reasons some are where a mythical creature emerged from the earth or it could be where there was a battle or a famous death or lots of different things mm -hmm. uh, but, <coughs> uh, but I think some of them do relate definitely to uh, phenomena. Which I think Castle Rig occurs where it is because they'd see the engineer who wrote about it in 1919 made that specific uh, suggestion. Did people see these lights mm -hmm. and then thought the area was sacred and the spirits visited and so they mm -hmm. built the ring of stones? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think that's quite probable myself. So is there any instrumentation or experiments done, or even we are those instruments that can also detect a greater chi, a greater life force, or some, some of the interesting phenomenon energetically that happens as these right. sites? They're power sites for a reason. Sacred right. springs, you know, water flowing, um, Earth's magnetic, magnetic soup and its flow. Uh, Actually, there's sacred sites. Uh were often places where thin places where uh, the spirit could contact where he was easy yeah. to get into the spirit world. Um, yeah, uh, so that has an effect one. on us. Yeah. Well, it could have an effect on us. Uh, don't overrate us for what we can do, uh, but uh, certainly I mean, the earth can on us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no two ways about that. Well, incidentally, you mentioned Marfa. Uh, what, what were the megaliths around Marfa? Oh, I'm sorry, Malta, Malta. Malta, I beg your pardon. Yeah, that's okay, Malta. Yeah, we had a great privilege of spending significant time at all the temples there. And just, um, it was it was one of those moments in life, you just say, wow, what is it about us? Why do we do it? And so early Neolithic, I mean, and yeah. unique. We, yeah. we don't know who the people were that landed them, built these things. Uh, it's a remarkable place, Malta. The only trouble with Malta is, is all the modern congestion of building and so yes. on. I've I'm... never seen an island wall-to-wall -wall construction before. Yeah, That's yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. But I mean, look at the country that, that you live in. I mean, replete. Can't throw a stone without hitting an hitting, ancient hitting site a stone. <laughs> in the UK. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, right. Right. What, yeah. what brought you on this quest? And then what is your current project? What new book do you have coming out? So that's where you're at with all this. My current project is to retire gracefully. <laughs> uh, I'm 78 now, so it's time to pack it in. Uh, and I can't actually get around some. So this was the latest one, you know, the, uh, that's the latest. Hours of Ancient and Sacred Places. Thank ah, you. wonderful. Yeah. Easily accessible on, on, online. How Amazon, do you yeah. describe the power? That's what we're talking about, is the power. Mm -hmm. and uh, how we perceive it, receive it. Um, yeah, uh, the power draws people, they sense it. Uh, and uh, as I say here, that there is the, it's the most difficult thing to describe uh, uh, and it's numinosity. Ah, that's a great word for it. Numinosity and sacred place. Mm -hmm. The answer's there. <laughs> you know it when you experience yeah, it, yeah. right? It's hard to describe it. You yeah. know it when you yeah, yeah. There is some research on it and there's some history about it, uh, but uh, basically that's it. Mm -hmm. And I describe a number of cases of... of uh, I, I just want to tell you, because I misheard Malta, 
for Marfa, which is a great light center. Right. We, we went there with the uh, Hal Potov. Hal Potov, part of the. Uh, oh, Hal Potov. Oh, we know Hal. Yeah. We did. Yeah. He, he, he went with us on. Uh, we were looking for the uh, lights, see where they were. And we went to the observation point. And people would then go, oh, 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 look, look, look. And yeah, you could see these lights. Uh, but we uh, we have powerful instrumentation on us and we could raise ourselves up higher. Um, and the lights are supposed to dance over the prairie there. Uh, I could clearly see where Jeeps and vehicles wending their way to, to ranches out on, on the thing. So that was one lot we can get rid of. The other was lights down uh, when you're looking towards Presidio. And uh, it we've managed to see what they were, uh, which were the tail lights and, and particularly the headlights of vehicles just going around a bend on this road miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, but they flare out uh, and uh, they were not what they thought. They were just headlights, but they did look just like layers of light, which, not to put everything down, uh, people have been reporting lights there before ever there were cars or anything. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Hal has got this big van uh, on top of which you can stand with equipment and so on. I just went up there for a casual look when we'd gone down towards the Chiefs of Mountains. And... These two, Sharla and Hal, were down there amongst the three or so bushes or whatever they are. And I was up there and I saw a light and it was gone. I didn't catch it. And they were furious with me because I'd seen a light. We hadn't seen any of the actual light. Uh, but uh, yeah, priests had seen the light. <laughs> talk to other witnesses, modern day witnesses, and they had seen lights bouncing around near the edges of the uh, road uh, and various places between the Marfa area and the Chiefsos Mountains area. And uh, it was definitely they were light phenomena, but it wasn't where they had the observation point. Oh, which interesting. Kept, kept yeah. it alive. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. We have a, we have comments from Bonnie. Yeah, Bonnie, you want to turn on your uh, mic and camera? Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. So I have a question concerning Paul's uh, thoughts on rocks because he's obviously given a lot of thought to rocks through the years, and. Uh, when I lived in Hawaii and knew some native Hawaiians, they believed that rocks actually had spirits and were alive. And it gave me some thought as far as that, that we are carbon-based creatures and the rocks are silicon-based. And of course our computers are silicon-based now. And my question is, Paul, have you thought about the consciousness of rocks and the aliveness of rocks and if so what are your thoughts on it mm. yeah. Intriguing well, question. Um, yeah well I, I i've done a lot of consciousness studies generally um and i do think they they can be related um not what conscious rocks per se although they're often interpreted as that in times past uh, but I think there are energies that can interact with. Do, do you know the work of Michael Persinger? Yes. He, he's dead now, of course, but yeah. I spent a lot of time with him when we discussed stuff. Up in Canada, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and we were very much of a mind about things that he feels that if you're near one of the lights, for example, uh, it can affect certain people will get hallucinations and you will see phenomena. Mm. I think that's really quite probable. I don't think that's the whole answer. I think there are, I, I'm shooting off in 10 different directions here 
in Ireland, for example, talking to a, a, a priest, they uh, they themselves have seen the phenomena, uh, spirits. Uh, and I asked one countryman, why don't we see these things now? This was before we did. Um, and he said, well, you people, he said, you move to the, through the landscape too quickly. You yeah. miss, yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. You right. You don't see, see things that we did because we used to walk almost everywhere in Ireland, I'm talking. As for the rocks being conscious, well, I think I mentioned the Chinese definitely thought there was chi in the rocks and that it did you good to be near it and receive the things. Um, I'm trying to think of so much stuff on this. Um, it don't, to my mind, there's not um, the rocks on conscious entities, but they can focus consciousness in certain ways oh. and effect on us uh, rather than uh, them being conscious, if you see what I mean. Well, right. also yeah. think about the deep and long standing relationship that humans had to red ochre full yeah. of iron, our blood is iron, and how it was a sacred um, practice to smear that all over your body, to smear your sacred objects mm -hmm. with it. So well, they use red ochre for the pictograms that we were well. looking at. Yeah, right. Right. And in some places, uh, a particularly acoustic area will be a rock wall and a surface of water. Uh, and ah, uh, yeah. often because of the way the spirits appeared, is they just smeared, just put mm -hmm. a smear of red ochre at that spot yeah. uh, because of the spirit things. Uh, I want to I want to just say that how we hunger for this relationship in modern times, and though our society kind of put its wall up to us. When you mentioned the Picos River and the the White Shaman's Cave, we um, we have met Bill Worrell. Yeah. It was a gallery in Santa Fe. And he tells this story and has a whole gallery devoted to this one iconic image right. of that shaman shape. And then he's added arms to it. He's added paraphernalia. He's added mm -hmm. uh, spirals. He's added uh, icon iconography to it. Right. But everywhere you look, there is his art. Maybe not all produced by him because this is very high end and it goes in galleries. But you walk down the street here and there'll be a fair and there'll be somebody that has copied that same design. And mind you, he copied it from this very ancient site and everybody has it in their gardens. It's, it's funny. We want a relationship with this phenomenon. We want to invite this into our life. Why? Because it enhances our life. It's greater she, she. Right, it's greater life force, and it's, I think it's a way to keep to remain in dialogue with our ancestors and with our history, and through that, and we can have this directly as well as you mentioned with this phenomenon, with Gaia, with Mother Earth, however you want to um, ha d define that relationship with her. So, do you think? I mean, something started you off in your path, and um, could you just briefly summarize what started you on? <laughs> your quest to explore this what is what is keeping you here all these decades yes yeah, stupidity probably <laughs> you are an old curmudgeon aren't you <laughs> such a british answer oh come on uh, no, i saw uh, a tremendous phenomenon uh in the sky uh to do with that rectangle of light and that went on and developed in interesting ways in fact to the point where i had a, a bit of a mental breakdown afterwards because what I saw could not exist hmm. in culture, but there it was, and I was exactly, yeah, zoned out. Um, uh, that's really what started me. But I'd always had an interest in flying saucers and stuff. So, but this one really propelled me, uh, and I got into it's a, too complicated to explain. But I got into Earth mysteries uh, and to various stuff, and that led me to more sophisticated work uh, uh, and things like um, sort of time and mind journal uh, is an academic journal as you mentioned and it, it, you've got to be a lot more rigorous walked around 
yeah. you, you have to put research, mm -hmm. put itemized research on things. And that's really how it got into, into my head and stayed in my head. Uh, and we've seen things as well. I mean, like the lights I mentioned in, in Wales, uh, in, in various areas. Um, I've seen a lot more. And we went, for example, to Outback Australia, mm -hmm. Erling Strand, actually, and with the TV guy. And we um, were looking for the Min Min lights. We had a, a personal report made to me <coughs> of an area where they were pretty busy. I think that's what Louise was taught. That was the name that she gave to them, Min Min lights, yeah. <coughs> now, the Min Min lights uh, are really named in a particular area, I think, Queen, Queensland, but mm. we were out in the wilds, much further west. And we looked for them. We talked to the Aborigines uh, and had some remarkable accounts from them. Uh, of, 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 they say when you get near them, there's a tightness in your chest mm. and, and to get too near them, dangerous. Right. Um, oh. so, uh, what we actually saw in the end, um, we saw, we had a, a, a a magnetometer with us, various other things. Uh, and uh, the magnetometer went blah, 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 on one occasion <laughs> because it was printing out, of course. And at that moment, we saw lights. It's uninhabited, totally uninhabited area. And we saw a light going across underneath. In fact, we saw it coming apparently out of the ground and it rose up and moved like that. Uh, and uh, we did get a photograph of that uh, and uh, between us. In fact, it was Erling who got the best one. Uh, and uh, he, uh, we could see this. Another occasion, phenomenal light. Uh, we were wandering around at night, you understand, in these remote, uninhabited deserts. This beautiful golden fan of light uh, shot up from the ground mm. uh, a few hundred yards away only momentary, very transient. Uh, and uh, something else we saw, a light. Anyway, but we didn't see the actual so-called Min Min light, uh, but we, we investigated them and uh, we've been around, we've seen a lot of light phenomena. Mm -hmm. And it just, one thing generates another, your interest carries on growing, unless you're half dead. Uh, <laughs> well you know i think it's kind of that's part of that journey and whether you know that what you started out with the term of the mysteries yeah. or, it's that idea that um life can be fun when we look at it in a mythopoetic way that we open ourselves to the concept that maybe maybe the rocks mm -hmm. do have soul spirit something going it's on certainly something to say they have us. life yeah. And if we can treat life in that way, whether it's a physically measurable phenomenon or whether it's just a respectful uh, relationship that you have with everything around you, that's, I think, where the shift can take place, where we can um, maybe come back around in a circle to living in a way that knowing that we're not separate from these things that surround us. And um, maybe that's a- And how special and a sacred moment when light shows up to you. I right. mean, think about what we make of light, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And um, and how we celebrate light from the yeah. solstice and the equinox and the sun's rise to Christmas lights. I mean, yeah. light to candles, right? Light's just sacred. So it's interesting when we see this in, a, in these mysterious- Huh. moments in these encounters warn, my curmudgeonly british warning <laughs> not so much literalized rocks as being conscious and whatever, right but phenomena happens in areas where there right. are rocks right uh, and uh and as i say i know in ireland they have rocks that have related to fairies and fairy lights of course the very concept uh, so there are connections, uh, and there's definitely, I think, mind-changing phenomena associated with various areas. And well with said. Life. Well so said. It's a complex thing, 
rather than just the, the rocks themselves being but there's a sense of being sacred at places, there's no two ways about it, as there are deep in forests. Uh, they, they seem to have a mind of their own around you. Uh, uh, and so, uh, yeah. We don't need to be literate. Uh, we need to be literate, not, we don't need to take things literally. Right. But yeah. we can be literate, we can be mythical. Well said, well said. Yeah. 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 So, so um, just say a quick word about Charles Fort because you were <laughs> the uh, archaeological editor for the Fortean Times. You can, I remember uh, many uh, a conversation about Charles Fort's research. What was the attraction there in just unusual phenomenon? And a lot of people don't know about Charles Fort. Charles Fort, he, uh, he was an American and he came over to dear old Britain uh, where the recording of unusual phenomena was at the time better kept. Uh, and he yeah. particularly looked at Wales and he cursed the Welsh language. How could anybody create a language like this? But he knew there was a lot of phenomena there. And he made an early association between earthquakes and light phenomena. And uh, ah. he was. Uh, Please don't. So he just he recorded it. Uh, it's called Fortium because after Fort, Charles Fort, uh, and he uh, got he's got books on a whole range of things. He had a quirky style uh, that uh, annoys some people, uh, but it was fabulous work at the time, way ahead of anybody else. Well, yeah. again, he would take anecdotal reports seriously and start to document them. You know, fish falling from the sky. How does that happen? Well, later they found out maybe a, a whirlwind takes them up and then drops them and just weird most, things going on. Most of the phenomena recorded now we know exist. Um, incidentally, light phenomena weren't UFOs first, of course. Mm -hmm. in, in medieval times, they were dragons mm. ah. century they were called dragons mm -hmm. uh, then in early modern times they were meteors and we still use that today to some extent uh, mm -hmm. and then there was ufos now uaps incidentally mm -hmm. uaps being used by the uh, u.s government uh, it was a terminology created or invented by Jenny Randalls in Britain. Mm. And she thought it was the most uh, innocuous way of describing phenomena. Right. Uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that yeah. It, it just, what do you because, think of, what do you think of the fact that now our government, your government, we're, we're starting to say, hey, let's compare notes on the UAPs. And now, now yeah. uh, what is it? Uh, well, yeah. I know in this country, the, the defense, Department of Defense have been keeping records. And like I said, the Geological Survey has been keeping oh. record of unusual atmospheric effects, uh, UAPs, um, uh, for many, many years. What I would like to conclude on is your very astute statement that if we truly want to understand these mysteries, we have to also acknowledge the mystery within. What can you elucidate on that? And then we'll let you go. And we'll, well thank you for this it, interview. It, it, just a, uh, a, an aspect of that that I would urge is that if you go to a sacred site, for example, don't try and do things there. Don't right. try and create yourself. You can do that further away. Just be there, be quiet, take it in, be yeah. calm. Because I find people uh, wanting to, oh, I've got to chant, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Uh, no, you don't. Just be there. Yeah. And then, as you've done, you know, in your own space, place, you can do things. Uh, I mean, we've done uh, labyrinths and things, but we got one jerk over here. I'm dead now, so I suppose I should be uh, respectful. But we have a, a stone labyrinth on the Isle of Scilly, on one of the Isles of Scilly. Uh, you know the Scilly Isles off the Cornish coast? Not, uh, never been there, but 
Mm. No, no, well, that's what they are. And there was this, this uh, labyrinth design was there. And this guy was a dowser and he doused the energy, as he said, on the uh, labyrinth, several hundred years old, this labyrinth. And it had gone out of kilter over the decades, he said. So what did he do? He moved all the stones into the design he thought it should be. <gasps> oh lost, my God. Yeah. Lost the only surviving stone labyrinth. We had a lot of turf labyrinths. And that's the sort of thing one has to... What hubris. Yeah. yeah and, and stupidity, really. It just, yeah. So yeah. that's what I'd warn. If I had a message for anybody, uh, I would say... Uh, be calm and respectful and try not to do so much. We're so active all the time. Mm, uh, that is. Let us Paul, be the probably... receptor sites that we are, right? For yeah. this and enjoy. It's speaking to us all the time. Such a profound message. Such a profound yeah. message because there is that there is that energy to want to move something. But one thing that we learned from yeah. uh, the Institute having its acreage of land, 500 acres, and, and having ancestral village land is that very quickly the Pueblo people tell you, don't move a rock, don't move anything, leave everything alone. You know, it's, it's kind of yeah. that new age thinking that you need to go create a circle or do something. Say, don't touch it, leave it alone. Absolutely right, Paul. Well, yeah. Yeah. So we can go to some of the big stones there that have cupules, and you'll still see the little round ball mm. there that made them yeah. be parked right there yeah so that's a wonderful message i just want to say thank you for joining us yes. on uh father's day yes i do envy the dinner table around which you and if your kids uh grew up to hear the stories that you had from the day's work um yeah. those must have been some fascinating stories shared around your dinner table as a family so I've never recording what my father his grandfather said because he was irish uh, and they were never recorded, those stories. Mm -hmm. uh, but there you go. Well, yeah. Thank you anyway, for letting us record these with you. Uh, and, 10 past seven here. Yes. I just want to say thank you to your wife, Mrs. Devereaux. Thank you for being there as well and weighing yeah. in. And yeah. uh, appreciate yeah. we are, uh, Thank you so much for thank this. Thank you, Paul. Do you want to hold up your book again? This is his latest book. The latest book is, and it's got everything updated in it. The power of ancient and sacred places. Like thank you Paul for being Devereux. so prolific, and thank you for all the research that you've done over many decades. And thank you for sharing it here with us today. Happy Father's Day. Bye. Bye. Bye.